the uh, the cyber task force uh, at FBI Boston. Um, I've been an agent since 2002. Uh, worked uh, a variety of different uh, violations of my career. Uh, when I was first uh, assigned to the Boston field office, uh, I worked on the the computer intrusion squad. At that time, um, we were. Uh, as you'd imagine, uh, it was a much different uh, look and, and landscape of what we were uh, investigating uh, back in that time. Um, but it's evolved uh, quite a bit. And also in that, in that uh, past 18 years or so, I've been able to um, get experience working uh, other violations um, and uh, kind of back to where I started. I think, you know, for me, when I first got into the FBI, I was a, mm -hmm. uh, an engineer with Sun Microsystems. Uh, so I was a um, supported the, uh, the you know Solaris uh, platform and and did installs for some of their customers in the DC area. Um, when I first got here, it's Sun. It was kind of like the security group was mm -hmm. uh, a very uh, respected uh, you know backline engineer type of group that handled all the security issues both with engineering and with support calls. So when I got to the FBI, I didn't really see myself as a security person per se. I was an investigator and I used the technology, um, but really have come kind of full circle now in understanding uh, both the, some of the, um, as a subject matter expert in the cybersecurity world, but also mm -hmm. uh, realizing that security is not just dedicated to the backline engineers uh, of the support world. Uh, although we need the, the kind of the deep dives into security, um, security is really something that everyone should be talking about. So I understand the audience today is kind of a general, um, there's a, a big wide range of, uh, of, of individuals with different levels of experience in security. Uh, so I think it's an important, uh, it's an important group to speak to. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, there's, you know, general users in addition to the, the security uh, folks out there. Yeah. And uh, one important thing you left out is that, uh, you know, you graduated from a master's degree program here at Boston College. You're a proud Eagle. <laughs> And I'll note this too, Doug's pretty humble. Uh, Doug was the uh, graduate student uh, of the year uh, and he received that honor this year. And uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you for that. Yeah, it was an excellent experience. And I, uh, I can't, you know, our, our director just, uh, uh, he kind of revisited and, and spoke to the, the uh, workforce about the different pillars of, of our organization. And one of those pillars is the partnerships. Uh, and I, I couldn't be more proud of our partnership with, with uh, BC and specifically with the cybersecurity program. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'm happy to uh, kind of lend a hand and, and help uh, d do the outreach when we can. So appreciate you having me again. Perfect. Just like I wrote it, Doug. Just like I wrote it. That's right. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks for, for your background. And, you know, really, um, if you could, Define, you know, really what the FBI's role is in cybersecurity. You know, what do they do and who do they work with and how do they do that? Sure. So um, it's a, it's a, it's, it has evolved. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, the, the mission of, uh, um, of the cyber division is to impose consequences on our adversaries. Uh, that means different things for different people, uh, for different organizations. Um, for us right now, at the Cyber Task Force in Boston, and this is kind of similar in, in most of the FBI field offices, uh, we've got a, a national security uh, squad, uh, as well as a criminal squad of cyber investigators that are, um, you know, investigating computer intrusion cases specifically. Mm -hmm. um, the, the role of the FBI is, is to conduct uh, a, a criminal investigation on the adversary, and we're sometimes we're starting at the victim uh, endpoint. Of the times we get information about a, a subject, and we're able to uh, begin an investigation with the subject or a suspect in mind. Um, but for us specifically on the criminal uh, squad, uh, our our cases should lead to indictments. Um, the, our national security. Uh, squad is a little bit, they have a little bit of a different uh, um, mission there was that in that um, their investigations tend to be a little bit longer. Uh, but in an ideal world, they also move eventually to an indictment. Um, recently in July, there were the two uh, Chinese uh, hackers that were indicted. Uh, mm -hmm. They're residents of China. Um, but that was a 10-year investigation that uh, had targeted three Massachusetts um, you know, organizations here. Um, and that case was a long case, uh, but they 
and they're not uh, domestic here. So they're, um, that indictment kind of shows that we have a, we have both have the same goal, but um, sometimes the way that we get to them it might be different, uh, different paths. Okay. And Doug, you mentioned, uh, you know, you're working with your task, but do you work with the state and the local governments as well here in Boston? Absolutely. Uh, the FBI's, uh, as I said, the partnerships are huge, uh, both in the private sector and, and in law enforcement. Um, the On our task force, we've got uh, some federal partners with the uh, Department of Education, OIG, uh, and the IRS, uh, but we've also got uh, a New Hampshire state trooper, uh, and we work very closely with the Massachusetts uh, State Police. Um, we couldn't do our job. I think this is true for every squad in the FBI. We couldn't do our job without uh, the, you know, the cooperation from state and local uh, police. So um, specific to, to cyber, uh, they're a huge part of what we do. And, um, you know, I, I can't thank them enough because I think they're very, uh, always very responsive and willing to, mm -hmm. to help us out. So. It's not like Excellent. the movies, Kevin. It's not like, you know, you, we're walking into a, a crime scene and we tell anyone to leave. Uh, the, the more the merrier is, is our kind of motto here in Boston, at least. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, all right, Doug. Um, when we look at uh, COVID-19, you look at some of the headlines and I have a bunch of stats and I know you have some too from the FBI, but, you know, this one's glaring here is, you know, COVID-19 is blamed for 238% surge in cyber attacks against banks. Okay. If you could, you know, thinking where we are now, what is the biggest threat out there right now, uh, not only to banks, but to any institution, entity, or government on the cyber uh, side? So the, the short answer is ransomware. I think ransomware is the biggest threat uh, right now to, um, to organizations in, in, the AO, in our area of responsibility. Um, but you mentioned that it's cyber, that, that stats and cyber um, attacks. And I kind of want to peel that uh, back a little bit because um, in our line of work, we, even though we refer to our squad as the cyber task force, um, if you're, if you're in this uh, kind of industry or you, you understand cybersecurity, you'll also realize that a cyber a computer intrusion uh, event is much different than a, uh, an email spoofed uh, phishing message. So uh, some of the uh, stats and some of the um, uh, way that we organize things in, you know, in, in today's uh, organizations or uh, vernacular is, uh, you know, using the term cyber, which is really kind of all encompassing in, in that term. I've been pushing the agents on our squad to use the term computer intrusion with everything we do, because, uh, you know, if someone's, uh, uh, if they're copying a domain, you know, maybe uh, kevinpowers.com is taken. So uh, I want to, I want to, create a, a Kevin Powers 123.com uh, and, and make it and act like I am the, the Kevin Powers uh, organization. Um, that type of spoofing is treated much differently by the letter of the law uh, than say if I gain access to the Kevin Powers do domain and, and I'm able to use it maliciously. So um, those, those kind of, um, you know, nuances uh, are important, I think, to recognize, uh, particularly for the people viewing, because an incident that might deal with a, a fraud or or a uh, spoofing matter uh, is much different than uh, you know us being able to charge someone with unauthorized access to a to a network. No, and that's good to recognize. Uh, you know the difference between cybersecurity and computer intrusion. Uh, I can tell you right now, though, I'm not going to change the name of the master's degree to a master's in computer intrusion and policy. So it's not going to sell as much. Um, uh, <laughs> hey, uh, you mentioned ra ransomware. Uh, there's going to be some folks on here who don't know what ransomware. Could you briefly you know, define what it is and what it does and uh, what it does to companies? You know, what's the real threat about it? Sure. So a ransomware attack uh, would involve a um, um, deployment of, of malware that it allows the uh, controller of that malware to uh, encrypt information uh, that is stored within a network. Uh, and in doing so, uh, the, the network administrators are unable to, to read the, that information uh, and the users are notified that they'll have to pay a ransom in order to get that uh, data decrypted. Um, it's a it's a huge problem because uh, as we all know the encryption works there's no shortcut around encryption uh, and unless you're able to get a decryption key um, by some other means uh, you're left with uh, you know three options really uh, 
uh, when you're when you're attacked. Um, the first would be to. Um, Am I getting ahead, Kevin? I apologize if I am. No, this is great. Okay, cool. So uh, the three options, if you were uh, uh, affected with, infected with ransomware, your uh, options are to, to restore from an, a backup that hasn't been touched. And we encourage backups to be maintained offline so that they're not infected or affected by the, the ransom, uh, by the encryption. Uh, the second would be to restore from scratch. Uh, and have to rebuild your system um, uh, from the ground up. And the third option is to pay the ransom. Uh, we've seen where there's uh, ransoms paid by victims who, once they obtain their data again, their data is corrupted uh, despite the fact that they paid and did everything that was asked by the, um, the, the subject. Uh, there's nothing that can happen and they have to you know, resort to that last, the last option, which is rebuilding. So um, we always encourage uh, victims not to pay the ransom, but we also understand um, that's a kind of a, a decision that should be made uh, with the stakeholders of the company and, or the organization that, that have, uh, you know, the, um, that are kind of facing the implications of, of the uh, alternative. And a part of that too is that you know the FBI's position is one you don't you you can pay the the ransom you might not get what you had back one two if you do it might be infected with even more malware and, and three you don't know who you're paying it could be going to a terrorist organization or whoever you know, absolutely that. yep uh, there's a, there's significant um, restrictions on on you know money being transferred to certain countries and it could uh, cause additional problems down the road um, if, uh, if it's not at least should be considered in, in the decision making process. Okay. And, and how do they get in the systems? I, I know one of the big threats here, you know, with the move home, uh, it's really, you know, phishing. Can you talk about phishing and spear phishing and, you know, what the threats are you're seeing right now? Sure. So um, phishing is overwhelmingly the, the most effective technique for um, that attack vector into an organization. Um, I, I will say too, we've learned and, and been briefing that uh, um, the, a lot of the initial, uh, uh, the initial intrusion into a, uh, a, a ransomware target is often times the RDP um, uh, accounts and ports that are um, scanned and then brute forced with uh, passwords. Uh, victims I've spoken to have have said, told me that there's um, an RDP account that all of the uh, RDP users are able to access. Uh, most of it is like a team that's working from home now, and they're they're all using the RDP sessions to get back into a server to access something. Um, that they'll need for work. So uh, lock down the RDP passwords, um, keep that, uh, keep those ports closed unless you actually need to, to RDP back in. Um, and the, the, other than that, that known issue that we've uh, been hearing about recently is uh, like you said, phishing. Um, phishing right now is the theme of phishing is COVID-19 uh, and work from home and uh, you know, the, the opportunities for, um, you know, as far as uh, school communications, be it uh, higher education or, um, you know, the elementary school, th there's a lot of uh, people starting to panic, including, uh, I wouldn't say I'm panicked, but I'm starting to realize <laughs> what this fall is going to look like. And I think, um, you know, you're, you're eager to kind of get that information and, um, mm -hmm. and access it. Have, have you not had that phishing uh, thought in the back of your mind? I would imagine that uh, you know recipients of those emails are um, a little bit click happy uh, to, to get that that information. Yeah, and to back that up, I, I mean, I have some stats here. You know, one is ransomware accounts for a third, if not more, of all cyber attacks. Um, I have here too that ransomware attackers capitalized on the coronavirus COVID nineteen pandemic, bumping the average enterprise ransom payment in uh, Q one. Uh, to one hundred eleven thousand six hundred and five one hundred eleven thousand dollars, a thirty-three percent spike in uh, the cost for ransomware. That's yeah. just to get your stuff back. Yes, yeah, it, and it's uh, it's become um, instead of kind of negotiating with the attacker, there's a uh, it's becoming much more professionalized uh, in that the victim. Um, doesn't necessarily have a dialogue with the attacker like it used to be, you know, two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, 
you know, websites set up that the victim will have to access, drop in their victim ID number and pay the ransom. Uh, and it's kind of an automated process. There's no, you know, negotiation um, that takes place anymore. Right. And, and the attackers, you know, who are they are, you know, out there right now? Who are you seeing? Is it criminals? Is it hacktivists? Is it nation state? Or is it all of the above? It's, it's all of the above. Uh, you know, obviously the, the nation state uh, um, problem is going to be a little bit more, mm-hmm. um, you know, I want to be a little bit more under the radar. Um, but it's a, um, but the ransomware is, is going to be, you know, from any level of sophistication, uh, it's going to impose a problem for a victim. Uh, and if that's what your 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 goal is and your your agenda is, maybe it wouldn't be your end game, but maybe a, a kind of a piece of the puzzle for what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, ransomware is is definitely going to be a problem. And um, you know the research companies are are you know pretty good about uh, pushing out indicators and um, you know things to look for in your network that are indicators of that ransomware. Um, because there's these ransomware attacks are, are multi-stage. So uh, once that malware gets dropped, you know, there's a series of, of um, for, depending on the variant, there's a series of, uh, um, of steps that need to take place before your data is able to be encrypted. So, uh, you know, keying in on what those initial indicators are is extremely important. Um, there's, you know, a handful of times that we are, uh, notified by other investigators that they they might you know have a um, they might have visibility into into something that a, a victim should know about or, or that some of those indicators that they see uh, we're able to make that notification early which is great uh, but that's kind of the exception to the uh, to the rule so understanding your network if if there's uh, you know if someone's accountable or that there's um, you know network admins here they would understand the term threat hunting and what that means for uh, that organization to be able to look for and, and detect um, that activity in their network before it, it's actually deployed. Excellent. And, and Doug, one of, one of the things out there too is, you know, we, I'll just define it because I talked about criminals, hacktivists, and uh, nation states. So criminal, that's, you know, think of your criminal who they just want your money, right? You know, they're, they're bad actors. Uh, the hacktivists, they're trying to send a message. You know, they're activists and they're going to target a certain company or a government and try to shut down their system to send a message, you know, some sort of political message. They'll take your money, don't get me wrong, but that's what their goal is. And then we have the nation states and, um, you know, we can talk further about the cyber espionage out there, but that would be uh, one of the biggest threats is um, China, where they're going after companies and they're going after intellectual property, right? Mm-hmm. So is that... You know, you'd agree with those definitions. Uh, sure. And one piece on this too with the ransomware is it's it's pretty easy to get, right? Um, it's being sold on the dark web as you know ransomware as a service, right? Mm-hmm. So you know it's really if you know, someone wants to get it and they want to target you, they they could do it, right? Sure. Yeah. Like a lot of these vulnerabilities, I mean, there's exceptions to the some of the zero day exploits out there, but uh, this malware is um, you know is it's uh, open source. It, you know, you can review it. You can see what it looks like. Um, there's a, uh, um, a, a something I had kind of thought up um, r- regarding the uh, the ransomware and how it kind of stacks in the the spectrum over the past decade or so of what the trends we've seen. Ransomware mm-hmm. now being the biggest uh, problem, and. I, what was once an extraordinary technique in ransomware uh, now right. is is in, uh, impacting regular and everyday people, right? Such as us. Just like uh, the DDoS uh, attacks had uh, years back, um, where you can essentially now go on uh, to a you know um, to you know website to purchase a DDoS and, and target a specific IP or target. Uh, we see a lot a lot of the gamer. Um, communities that are a little bit more mm-hmm. um, vicious towards each other. They'll, you know, DDoS each other. Uh, I, I find that, um, you know, the, these types of techniques that are uh, extremely, uh, they're kind of uh, packaged together so that it's a, uh, it's a much easier uh, infection and um, uh, uh, attack than, you know, what the ransomware subjects were doing five years ago. So. Yeah, and, and recently too, I, I read a report um, 
we're not only a asking for the money, well, they're not asking, you know, they give me the money if you want your information, but they're also uh, you know, taking your personal data now and publishing it saying, hey, if you don't play the game now, if you don't give us the money within 24 hours, they can start posting personal sensitive emails where they're going after like board members, uh, the C-suite and others, they're not only there just to get them, now they're going to just start embarrassing people as well if they can. Yeah, I mean, they're they're twisting the, the knife, uh, you know, while they're uh, trying to, um, to, you know, possibly disrupt the, the victim. Uh, now they're starting to, to make it more painful for that victim uh, mm -hmm. to um, compel them to, to pay that ransom, which are... Uh, which are getting to be higher, as you mentioned, um, because now the um, the implications and, and these types of issues are coming up with uh, regards to exposing uh, what information was taken. Um, you know that that negotiation and th there's you know there's data brokers out there that'll you know they don't care about infecting anyone or breaching anything, but once they get the data, uh, now they're going to broker a, um, a a deal with with criminals that want to buy it and maybe the victim will pay more than what the criminal is paying. So uh, there's all sorts of these tiers and different services and, and roles out there. Yeah. And Doug, I'm just going to jump uh, in and uh, you and I were just throwing out fishing and spear phishing. Uh, we got to assume some of the folks in the audience don't know what that means. So uh, phishing email, that's pretty much, uh, that's the broad shot, right? You know, where there's a link in an email that's coming from, you know, it could be, like you said, Kevin Powers or DougDoman.com. You don't know who it is, and it could be offering, you know, whatever, you know, free tickets or things along those lines, and someone clicks on it, and that's, you know, the malware that comes in. It's a broad shoot. Spear phishing is more along the lines of the social engineering. You know, I look and I target, um, I'm the bad actor. I target your executive assistant. I, you know, follow him on Facebook. I see him on LinkedIn. Uh, I then send an email that looks like yours to him and ask him to wire me or wire a bank account to pay off a certain bill. And he does that assuming it's you. And what happened was he was socially engineered. Is that mm -hmm. a good? Exactly. And the, the reconnaissance uh, phase of that attack, uh, you know, can be, you know, days, months, or years, depending on uh, who they're going after and how sophisticated of a spearfish that that's going to be. Um, so. Right. That's what they call the whaling, which is really just a spear fishing and you're going after, you know, like the chairman of the board or the CEO or the COO. Right. Right. Excellent. Um, so, Doug, OK, so now we'll jump into, um, boy, this is moving quick, as usual, when we start talking. Um, uh, all right. Like, uh, do you have any examples of cases you worked on, you know, regarding ransomware and how, you know, some good success stories there? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, Unfortunately, I don't have specific uh, stories about ransomware. There's, you know, we can talk about cases once they're adjudicated. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're, we're unable to talk about anything that's, that's going on. And sometimes these are year long investigations. Uh, um, but what I can do is maybe describe a little bit about, um, you know, how the FBI has organized the ransomware investigations, uh, because I think it would be helpful for, um, you know, to kind of justify why you would reach out to the FBI if you were uh, impacted by ransomware. Um, let yeah, me start. I, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's good because I could not. Uh, maybe we can go on to um, this and like kind of walk through it. So, you know, uh, I'm representing a company, you know, and I'm outside counsel. Um, we suffer a breach, it's ransomware, and I call the FBI. You know, what should I expect? You know, yeah. So if you call me, <laughs> what you'll expect is uh, we'll get a we'll get you on to a, hang up. <laughs> no, uh, we'll get on a phone call. Um, you know, with with you know, generally there's two agents uh, that are on the phone call. Uh, we'll um, we'll ask that the, whoever all the decision makers are. Mm -hmm. we, we can kind of. Um, you know, phase in those folks that need to be uh, privy to the call. Uh, but essentially what we want to do is figure out uh, if this is going to be a, a case that, um, you know, first of all, meets the federal threshold for prosecution, uh, because ultimately we'll have to get prosecutors involved to issue legal process. Um, but what we want to, what I want to offer, and, and I think what should happen is uh, a brief phone call to kind of understand um, what's going on in the, at the victim organization. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and to get an initial set of indicators that are, you know, were discovered by either the victim or if there was an incident responder that came in uh, that was able to um, to kind of detect and, and start to mitigate the problem. What those, right. what that initial uh, look of indicator, what that initial indicators look like. Um, we can, uh, you know, we're able to, uh, through an authority, preserve records at a, uh, a provider, for instance, um, which doesn't give us any access to information. It just notifies the provider to put things on hold, uh, to preserve that, that information for us to uh, start to, um, you know, get our, uh, our report, our initial report, uh, and our case opening done so that we can then go back with the proper legal process and obtain it. So having those indicators early is very important. Uh, we can also kind of discuss uh, if there's any kind of notification or, or publicity uh, that's going to have to be uh, done on behalf of the victim and their customers or clients if there was a data breach. Um, mm -hmm. We can kind of talk through a lot of those issues on the phone uh, and and maybe even offer some, some pointers. I mean, the victims, uh, if there's individuals on this, this call, that, I think that's a huge uh, step in the right direction. As you'd imagine, there's a lot of victims that do, really don't know where to begin. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't understand. They need to notify uh, the, you know, the victims of, that might have had PII exposed, for instance. And so uh, we oftentimes walk and kind of step through some of these issues. Uh, we provide some resources, many of which I've, I've learned from the, the degree program, quite honestly. Um, and we're able to just kind of uh, help them stop the bleeding at first. Our uh, our mission really is to, to make sure the victim is is able to uh, mitigate the threat uh, before we bring in any kind of investigative resources uh, to the problem. Because what will happen when the FBI does get involved? We'll hang you know we hang the phone up. We start to open up a case. Our first uh, email back is going to ask for uh, a laundry list of things that we'll need uh, as evidence. You know, if there's a, a memory captures that were done on the, you know, the, the, the patient zero machine, for instance, uh, if we'll need to grab a, any forensic uh, evidence, log files, uh, emails that were obtained, um, you know, an, an email is a great piece of evidence. But what we have to have from the email is the header section. And if you just forward us an email, it's not going to contain any of the IP source IP addresses uh, or how it was routed. So um, understanding, you know, can I give this email to the FBI? How do I do it? Uh, is it something that, you know, companies and organizations can work through in a tabletop uh, mm -hmm. before ever, you know, having to experience something like that. So, um, so it's important to know if, um, you know, that we're not going to show up lights and sirens uh, outside yeah. the, uh, the physical building. Um, we, it's going to be, it can be handled over the phone and remotely initially. Um, and because we are in the field and we, this is our area of responsibility. Uh, if there is a need for kind of a personal mm -hmm. connection and a personal visit, uh, we, we certainly would, would make that too. We don't want to overburden the victim at their most kind of vulnerable time. So a lot of this is uh, kind of pre, um, is kind of established on that initial phone call. Yeah. And that's a good point. The FBI's view, this is a victim, you know, that when you look at the company or whoever is, you know, suffering the breach, they're a victim here. And, and I guess, and I think you addressed this when you said it depends, right? Like, so I'm sure there's different tiers. Like, uh, you know, it's more the bigger the breach, the more likelihood the FBI is going to get involved or the resources are going to go in um, to the investigation. Uh, is that how it works? It, it, um, it, it's, it does. It kind of is a, um, uh, it's kind of a binary thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's either uh, it, we're going to open it and we're going to work this as an investigation and it's going to be supported by our prosecutors um, or uh, it doesn't meet the, the threshold of a federal crime. Um, you know, we don't have we may not have the resources right. available to investigate it at that time mm -hmm. uh, and we can defer or, or to another organization or, or um, um, you know, to another field office. Uh, so once that once that case is opened, uh, it will not be closed until there is a logical conclusion, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. there's no further leads uh, of value or, um, you know, we've identified an IP block and we can't get further, or we know who this is based on social media and other things that we've been able to put together. So um, it's a, uh, 
you know, our cases, we don't necessarily rank or prioritize them uh, on the squad by, by, you know, the financial loss. Um, it's kind of an how, how big of a problem do we need to solve uh, the end result and the, you know, the victim is always forefront in our mind as far as, um, you know, what finding a resolution for that, for that victim. Yeah. It, and a piece of that is, uh, you know, preaching this out there and uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong here, it's important for anyone who suffers a breach, no matter how small bit, to report it to you. And this goes to kind of uh, the information sharing that you collect, you get to see trends out there of the bad actors, who they're targeting, what they're using, more importantly, so you can help and get the word out there to stop. For sure. And we have, uh, you know, the uh, analysts on the squad that are embedded, uh, who are always kind of looking at that, that larger landscape, um, looking at, uh, you know, what are the, the types of questions we should be asking victims and, and asking uh, the, the, you know, the private industry. Um, our ic3.gov portal has been a really great way to capture a lot of that information. Um, we were just notified of like the this the the years uh, the six month uh, for 2020 at the end of June was uh, showed that there was double the amount of IC3 reports uh, than there had been the six month period prior. So uh, I know that the word is out there, which is great. Uh, and mm -hmm. ic3.gov is a good resource. Okay. Sometimes you don't want to use, uh, you know, call or bother someone on the phone or with an email, uh, but you might have observed something or seen something on a network, uh, or even in, in you know, the physical world when we when we are able to get back out there, uh, and you want to report it uh, and just kind of have peace of mind that it's been done. So um, ic3.gov is a is an excellent resource for that, and, and in looking at that that bigger picture and the trends, uh, you know, throughout the the years. All right, uh, Doug, you talked about what you do do. Uh, why don't you make it clear to everyone what you don't do if I call and I suffer a breach? Sure. So, um, uh, like I said, we don't show up with uh, our lights and sirens going outside the building. Um, I have worked in investigation where it was in a, another country where the, the, the responding officer put yellow tape around the server. Uh, we don't do that either. Um, what we want to do is... Um, uh, you know, like I said, help the victim to really stop the bleeding, mm -hmm. figure out where, uh, what the next logical steps are for, for the victim, but also uh, kind of uh, um, find those indicators that we're going to need to act on right away. Um, we also don't, you know, in our investigations, some of the concern we have is, is uh, as far as compliance issues or, uh, you know, regulatory issues that the victim might have to comply with. Um, although they're important, those aren't decisions that we would necessarily be involved in um, with the victim. Those are things that, uh, that, that, that compliance issue is something they need to deal with, with, uh, you know, their counsel and, and, and figure that out. Yeah, and it's important for everyone to understand that when you come in, you're not coming in there to fix everything and get all the computers set up and up and running. You're conducting an investigation. Exactly. And we, you know, from the edge of the network, from the edge of the victim's network, mm -hmm. outwards to the rest of the world is kind of where we're going to we're going to be conducting that investigation uh, from the edge, edge looking internally. That's really going to be uh, the victim's responsibility. And we do not jump on the keyboard and, uh, you know, uh, conduct any kind of, uh, run any kind of tools unless um, it's something that's requested or required uh, in the investigation. And those are well thought through and, and, and discussed uh, processes. No, that's perfect. All right, Doug, um, I'm gonna shift gears here. And uh, you know, right now we have about 20 minutes left and uh, we got a lot of questions coming in. Cool. Um, what I'm thinking, um, you know, before, uh, we take that question. Is there anything you want to address right now uh, before we start taking everyone's questions? There's a bunch out there and they're, they're all pretty good. Okay, great. Um, you know, nothing particular uh, except the fact that, uh, you know, that IC3.gov portal is, is mm -hmm. an excellent resource. Um, I would also encourage uh, viewers to look at idtheft.gov. Uh, idtheft.gov is a great, uh, a lot of, has a lot of great information for uh you know, victims of identity theft, looking at that page once you're compromised mm -hmm. is not a great 
feeling because it's all the things you should have done before you were uh, your data was was uh, exposed. So having an idea of what idtheft.gov uh, offers and and the information on there is, um, is is pretty important because we're you know from an individual level uh, we we will not get involved in many investigations that uh, where one person's identity was impacted. Mm -hmm. um, our our investigations they have to meet a certain threshold. Um, and so in a lot of these, uh, these people that I speak with, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but you kind of have to learn to protect yourself uh, and you can't rely on the, the FBI to come protect you or, or, or deal with the problem after the fact. So um, soaking that all up, understanding how to protect yourself personally, uh, I think is really important. Yeah. And uh, we want to go through, so what we went through so far, just to recap, is one, what the FBI does, you know, what's their role, what they can do to help you. Uh, what are the current threats, you know, really focusing on ransomware, phishing, spear phishing, uh, and then really looking at, you know, what happens if there's a breach, you know, with the FBI's role and how they play out. And one piece before I go to the questions, um, and really the questions coming in are really like, great, we, you know, thanks for scaring us. How do we address this? And I think, you know, we have that all set up and we'll just go through the questions to address that. Um, but one piece, Doug, and I think this is important, we talked about this, is really the relationship with the regulators. You know, if I'm outside counsel for a company, uh, I'm dealing with you. Do you deal at all? I, I know the answer, but many here won't with the regulate regulators, meaning, you know, whether it's federal or state regulators who are looking at the company now more as they're a defendant, you know, because they had the uh, personally identifiable information or uh, sensitive information mm. and they suffered a breach. Can you speak to that? Sure. Um, so here locally in, in Boston, we um, we have very limited uh, interaction with the SEC, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if there was a, um, you know, there are certain certainly scenarios in which uh, they may become interested and, um, you know, get involved in a, a breach. Again, like you said, looking at the, what we refer to as the victim is now the defendant. Um, right. We understand the sensitivities there. Uh, it's not a proactive relationship that we share with them currently. Um, and in an investigation, um, you know, there's a precedent for that on our, our market and securities fraud squad uh, who deal with the SEC quite a bit on securities that, uh, um, you know, that are pump and dump schemes and that sort of thing. Uh, in the cyber uh, security squads and in our cases, uh, very limited contact. And uh, it should not be a reason why we are not contacted. We'll be a very uh, transparent with our process and um, we can even have a conversation to determine uh, if it's gonna be the right direction or, or not. So um, yeah, I don't want that to be a, a, a mitigate or a factor of why you would not uh, uh, reach out for us. Yeah. In and that's something really important because a lot of folks look at government as government, right? They don't differentiate. So if there's any information you're getting, are you sharing that with the regulators? Uh, no, um, I, I, like I said, I've not worked in the, my cases that I've had uh, and there've been some pretty significant uh, breaches that the victims have suffered. Um, there's not been any kind of, um, you know, exchange of information with the regulators. Now, uh, you know, certainly I could like be legally compelled to provide that and we would not right. hold that back, um, but that's not happened. And I, I would encourage, uh, you know, the, the people on the call to understand what we're gonna look for is what we refer to as bad guy data. Um, we're not gonna come to ask for a list of customers. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not gonna come to ask for, um, you know, PII of any employees uh, without the proper legal process, we're going to ask initially for bad guy information. So uh, one of the good conversations that everyone could have tomorrow or, or as soon as possible is with the, you know, the um, general counsel of the organization, ask them, you know, what, what's the threshold? Can we provide an IP address of an attacker to the FBI? Because for the FBI, that's a, that's a really big, um, that's a big win for us because then we can kind of uh, open or initiate an investigation based on that information that's provided to us. It may be worthless to the victim. They may not, uh, it may not be a big lift and the, the, you know, um, but it could help us uh, down the road. So. Excellent. Thanks Doug. All right. So I'm going to go to the questions. We have a slew of them. So we'll, we'll trust them by one by one. Um, 
All right, some of these here we've already hit upon. Uh, all right, there's a question here dealing with um, mitigation. Uh, it talks about like, hey, we're we're a small business. You mentioned um, so uh, here it is. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll just summarize that question in a way. It, it, the question you know to both of us is, hey, I'm a mid-sized firm. Uh, ransomware is coming at me. What can I do to protect myself? Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that, Doug? I have some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll let you give your thoughts first. Well, if there was a if there was a specific software or, or you know feature that we could enable, uh, I think that we could share. I, I would definitely do that, uh, and would be uh, you know you'd probably be very wealthy. Uh, <laughs> I think what's very important for organizations to understand and is to really start to kind of uh, categorize your your the information at your at your company. Figure out. What are the key assets? What are the things that we cannot operate without? Um, and and start to defend that, uh, you know, wholeheartedly uh, before anything else. Um, you know, if ransomware is going to impact an organization, um, they they need if they have an offline backup of their key assets, uh, they're going to be able to recover and respond to it within 24 mm -hmm. hours. They have to make sure that they've tested the backup. Uh, and they have to make sure that the backup is not in the cloud or accessible from that network that's being infected by ransomware. So uh, as a mid-level organization, um, defending, def defining what your key uh, assets are, uh, creating an offline backup and a, a backup uh, schedule, testing the backup regularly is the first and foremost thing that I would be doing. Yeah, it, it, and my advice on that too really, uh, it comes down to your employees. You know, there's simple ways to handle this. Um, you're not going to buy yourself out of it, right, with technology. You're just not. Uh, it really comes down to a cyber culture, you know, and that comes from the top on down. You know, you need buy-in at the top uh, where, you know, the individuals look and say, like, geez, we're all in this together. Especially now in COVID-19, everyone's, you know, in a remote office, right? Doug and I, we're in dorm rooms. Uh, everyone else is working from home. Uh, and when you think of when you're working from home, you know, it sounds nice, but most people aren't in an office. Most people are at a kitchen table. Uh, most people have, you know, two, three, four kids running around. Uh, they're sharing the Wi-Fi. They're sharing, you know, potentially personal computers. Um, they're sharing the same printers. Uh, and there's a lot going on there. And it comes down to, like, how do you protect all of that? Um, some easy tidbits here is just putting together, you know, a list of frequently asked questions, right? You know, like, what's PII. What, do, what does that really mean? Uh, hey, is my Wi-Fi secure? How do I secure my Wi-Fi? You know, what's a step-by-step -step process to, in, uh, you know, install malware protection, right? Can I use Wi-Fi, you know, at Starbucks? The, the answer is no. <laughs> but then tell them why they can't do that. Um, tell another, them what a VPN is. Yeah, jump in, Doug. I was going to say another one is the social media policy. If you, mm -hmm. uh, there have been uh, several instances of, of employees who have posted social media posted to social media with pictures uh, of their company information in the background um, mm -hmm. that, that is now visible. So what are the, what are the going to be the uh, ramifications for an employee who, who does something like that? Yeah. It, it, what's IOT? What's an IOT device? You know, what is that? How do I secure that? Am I actually using it? You know, uh, am I responsible for private information when I'm at home? You know, mm -hmm. who has access to that and how do I share that? You know, that's one easy step. Another is training your employees, you know, really making them aware. We train them on everything. Security needs to be part of that as well, and specifically cybersecurity. And, you know, for low money, if you train your force up, you know, on what phishing is, what spear phishing is, how you protect. And then you have a consequence to it if they don't, just like anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone doesn't secure the files and you're in a law firm, that person usually gets in trouble. It should be the same with cybersecurity as well. So those, you know, those are great mitigating practices. Another piece too for the mid-sized company, um, I, I get some stats here. It's like two out of three hacks that come in are usually from the supply chain. You know, that's where a third party that you use, whether it's a cloud service provider or you know, whoever you're using, you know, it could be the accountant, it could be the law firm, whoever, the malware is coming in there. Uh, you're going to make sure they're trained up too and they believe in a safe cyber culture as well because mm. if they don't 
everything you do could be for naught. Right. What do you think, Doug? Uh, yeah, no question. I mean, um, uh, the other the problem is, you know, devices. It's always been an issue is having, uh, they call it shadow technology, um, yeah. where it's technology that's being used by the employees that may not be uh, inventoried at the organization, which means that the IT uh, group is unable to secure it. And, uh, and include that as part of their enterprise protection. So while at home, you know, employees may be, uh, um, it may be a little bit easier to, you know, log in from a personal device to check email um, on a device that's maybe not protected. Um, so uh, that, that stuff definitely gets, um, you know, it, the, the effects are gonna be, um, you know, bad and now that we're, you know, isolated and in these, uh, in our homes, as you'd mentioned, with a lot of other things going on, um, we may not be focused on the work uh, like we had been when we were, you know, working in an office and um, had a little bit more, uh, you know, space and, and uh, solitude uh, to get that work done. Right. And uh, another, so I have another question here for you, Doug. Uh, you mentioned uh, indicators for ransomware. Can you give us examples of what to look for? Sure. So the, the ransom note that's provided that was received by the victim, uh, any kind of Bitcoin address or virtual currency that they're asking to be, uh, um, th that they're asking the, the money to be sent to, uh, email addresses, uh, any domains, uh, those are all, you know, every victim was going to have those and they're going to be, uh, understand what they are. Um, sometimes there's a, um, the initial, the, the malware that initially infects the, uh, uh, the network uh, is detected um, and it's quarantined. So if we had a, a, a machine that the, that the victim organization is able to take out of production quickly, um, you know, and leave it isolated from the rest of the network, uh, that's something that's very good evidence for us to have a copy of the malware um, and capture the memory uh, on that, uh, that machine. Uh, we refer to that as patient zero. Uh, of the network. It's going to be the first machine that was infected. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that uh, is, is excellent evidence for us to, to have. It tells a lot about where the malware comes from, uh, gives us signatures of the malware, uh, and it helps us to get, do a little bit more of um, a threat hunting uh, investigation, um, you know, out in, um, you know, in those other, uh, the, the other portals we've got access to and the other repositories of information that are out there. All right, Doug, I get, have another question uh, that you can hit out of the park, I have no doubt. China and Russia have been highly active in IP theft and election influence. How dangerous are these state actors to U.S. businesses? Um, well, it's a little bit out of my lane, and I'm, I'm not uh, ex like well prepared to answer it because uh, I would want to make sure that that's an accurate uh, response. I mean, anyone can open the paper and see that 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 there is a <laughs> do you want me to answer that for you Doug? Please. Uh, <laughs> it would be it would actually be a uh, uh, yeah. yeah no, but, uh, so on this one I'll, I'll just go by what um assistant attorney general john demur said at the last uh, boston conference in cybersecurity, and when he spoke at uh, boston Go college law school in one of our classes he talked about the china initiative uh and what he said it's very dangerous right now. Um, there's a focused, concerted effort over and they called it the China Initiative. Uh, and, and the reason was, and they showed us this pie chart, it was 98% of the tax were coming from China, focused on U.S. businesses to steal intellectual property and two, um, you know, focused on academia as well, to steal the research. And, and right now with COVID-19, there's been, uh, you know, not only from Russia, but primarily China going after uh, the intellectual property and trying to find these vaccines. I don't work for the government, so I'm just saying what I heard when I, don't I, disagree. When I interviewed <laughs> the assistant uh, attorney general. Yeah. All right, let me get to the... Um, Another, uh, I just want to, while you're looking at that, Kevin, I'll just point out that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the CIA triad of security, the confidentiality, uh, integrity, and availability. I think when you're learning about those different aspects of security, for me, the integrity always seemed like a, a kind of a, a, um, uh, a weak attack, you know, it's a very um, uh, overestimated as far as an attack goes. But uh, 
when you look at integrity of information now and what I see uh, just in the zeitgeist of uh, today with regards to social media, understanding the sources of information and verifying the integrity of information uh, is almost becoming as important and most, the most important thing um, because we're relying on some of these sources for information, whether it's about the quarantine, um, uh, the, the other issues that we've seen this year, uh, I find the integrity to be a, um, a really important issue. I know we've addressed it in the classes with regards to the, uh, the deep fakes technology, et cetera. Um, but uh, you had mentioned the election and the, the China and Russia attacks. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think, as I mentioned, those, those types of techniques are now being used uh, by everyday people. Um, so mm -hmm. that's a, uh, you know, the attacks are not necessarily just the, um, uh, the cyber and the computer intrusion attacks. It's, it kind of runs the gamut for what, what's thereafter. Yeah, uh, yeah, some of the questions we just got, Doug, were on um, HIPAA protected material, so healthcare sensitive information. And you, know, you can see with COVID-19 where they're going with that, but it was more focused on, do you see an uptick uh, on the level of attacks going at the, the hospitals right now or the, um, the healthcare providers? Or has that been pretty much staying level? No, there's been a huge uh, uh, focus on healthcare. Um, web commerce and the providers are the are the highest uh, category of victim uh, mm -hmm. in the past six months that we've seen. So healthcare is a close second, um, and you know for obvious reasons, um, most of which is that 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 information, medical information, is the most valuable, or at least the subjects believe that to be the most valuable, um, you know, to sell again. Um, so uh, there's absolutely a, a big problem, and I, I think I read stat in your paperwork, Kevin, that said uh, something like sixty per seventy percent of uh, emails regarding COVID nineteen are actually fraud emails. Fifty percent. Yep. 50%. Yeah, I sent those over to you. Yeah, it's 50% of them are fraud emails. Uh, and and come, you know, from malicious domains, I'm looking at that now. Um, uh, on the uh, HIPAA one too, there's a question on like, you know, what would be the best framework or there's a policy out there. I mean, that's beyond our scope, but uh, one of the frameworks out there that the federal government, uh, you know, has put forth is in this framework. Um, and, you know, that's a good one to follow. Would you agree, Doug, with that? Um, as far as uh, HIPAA? Yeah, for healthcare, it, you know, in a general sense, um, protecting data, uh, the NIST framework. Uh, oh, the NIST one. framework. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. NIST framework is, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty accessible. Um, there's a lot of frameworks out there and I'm, you know, I, I've kind of have a, a generalist when it comes to this, but um, the NIST framework is, I think the most accessible, uh, it's well documented. It's kind of an easy way to jump into a framework if you're looking for something to kind of uh, uh, implement into your security program. Yeah, so uh, the last question I have here, it's from uh, Elizabeth O'Sullivan. I'm throwing her name out there, Liz O'Sullivan. She's over in uh, Belfast Island. She's our new Fulbright Scholar and she's the CISO for Allstate Insurance. So yeah, it got to be pretty late over in uh, Ireland right now. So uh, Liz, is quite a great question. What is the appropriate response for an enterprise phishing training repeat offender? Some research suggests that punishment can create tension and distrust between the employees and the security team. Um, you know, Doug, uh, I'll answer that question. My thoughts on that. Um, and these are my, you know, Professor Powers thoughts. Uh, uh, I think when you look at the repeat offender, uh, you have to look at if it's you know, is it negligence or is it just totally disregarding the email? You know, you have to look at each. So it has to come back to what type of training are you offering? Is the training providing that individual uh, with the resources and the tools to understand what is going on with that type of uh, phishing uh, email, whether it's a spear fish or just a general broad one? And then if it continues to happen, uh, you know, you have to take action on that. You know, that just is a dereliction of duty at that point and some punishment has to come in. Do you have any thoughts on that, Doug? No, I would agree with you. And there's, you know, different levels of, of not or not uh, passing those phishing tests, whether, uh, you know, you, you move proactively on an on a email and, and forward it to your IT department, or you just ignore it and delete it. Um, or if you, like you said, click on something and don't report it, 
uh, you know, the severity uh, is, is, you know, between those three examples, I think is pretty uh, important to recognize. Yeah, here's another one. Um, is there anything, at, we got a minute left, so I figured I'd throw this one up. Is there anything in the security marketing hype cycle that makes your job hotter? Uh, that's a great question. I've never gotten that question before. Um, I would say October gets pretty busy for you. October and in, in, uh, is essentially an important um, is a is a is a busy month for us. Um, it, you know, the the marketing I think is good because it starts it keeps that conversation going. Um, I think all of us understand there's not a, it's not one, and I think marketing companies have gotten away of, uh, you can buy this one thing and you'll be secure. Um, as well as the fact that there is such thing as being a good victim. Uh, when we talk about gathering and obtaining evidence, uh, if a victim does not have any evidence, then we don't have a case to work. Um, so uh, having those companies that are, you know, the, the security companies that are involved uh, is, a, is a huge benefit because they, they do an investigation, uh, we're able to, to glean leads off of that investigation, uh, it keeps the conversation going, um, and I think it's, a, uh, it's overall a win, and you know, any, uh, any discussion about security is a, a good discussion, as it's about. so I'll leave it there. Excellent. All right, with that, everyone, uh, first off, Doug, thanks again you know, for you know, coming on here and doing this fireside chat. We really appreciate it. It's been very informative. And uh, thanks for everything you're doing out there for us you know, with the FBI and also as an, a great ambassador for our program here at Boston College. Um, you know, next time I see you, I'll get you one of our mugs. Uh, Sounds like a plan, <laughs> You yeah. probably have a cupboard of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll We've got a couple one. in the desks, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm uh, you know, uh, happy to, to uh, do these anytime you, you guys need uh, uh, or want some uh, information and that we can provide and uh, appreciate you keep asking us to come back. So Yeah, and uh, you know, we should mention too, I should call you uh, Professor Doman too, because uh, Doug's going to be uh, teaching over at Boston College this fall um, on governance, risk assessment, and compliance with uh, Phil Aldridge. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it'll we'll be uh, looking forward to the fall. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, Doug. Hey, thanks everyone for participating. Like I said, we're going to do a series of these webinars uh, probably every other month, and they're going to be focused on cyber and national security. Uh, look forward to seeing everyone soon, and uh, really look forward to seeing everyone, hopefully, uh, knock on wood here, uh, on campus at Boston College. So take care, and uh, have a great evening, and stay safe. See you, Doug.